Eternal life, quite a concept. Pick your best year. Pick your greatest strength and energy. And it'll take the whole eternity to thank Him. And eternal, and eternity never ends. Praise God. I was reading, let's all stand as we turn to Colossians chapter 2. I'm going to be reading out of the New King James Version. But I was reading where someone came to Jesus over in Mark and said, what must, what must I do to inherit eternal life? We live in a world that's still trying to find out how to figure that out. Where that fountain of youth is, I went to it down in Florida. Pretty well grown up with weeds, folks. <laughs> and uh, it's amazing how that... Uh, People are still searching. They're just doing it more scientifically now. The bionic man, you know. Make us hearts and lungs that last until they wear out, I guess. But down in the heart of mankind, there is that desire. Even among the, un, the, the unsaved, among the worldly, to live forever. The, the whole doctrine of reincarnation is, is an offspring of living forever, somewhere, some way. And I'm so glad that the truth reigns in this house. The good old inspired Word of God still holds sway in the hearts of multitudes around this world. His truth will endure to all generations. Hallelujah. And Jesus Christ preparing a place for all of those who will prepare their hearts in this world. Live for Him. Walk with Him. And do their work for Him. And one of these days He's going to say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. So let's, we're going to talk about how to make that day come become a reality here for the next few moments. Colossians chapter 2. Some warnings coming from the Holy Ghost through the Apostle Paul. Verse 8. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. According to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power beware lest anyone spoil you cheat you deceive you through the philosophies of men Let's turn over in Daniel. It's not just our generation where there is an onslaught against truth. The truth of Almighty God, the truth of His Word. But all the way back in Babylon. All the way back to the history of mankind. Daniel chapter 3, verse 14 Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? Now if you are ready at the time you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, the psaltery, the symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made, good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God 
who will deliver you from my hands. King thought he was the king of the universe, didn't he? <laughs> he thought he was somebody. Pride goeth always before destruction. Haughty spirit always before a fall. Who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? I want to take us through this thought today of taking our stand in this present world. Taking our stand in this present world. It's important that we also join with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to not bow to the call of this world, to the gods of this world, to the entertainments of this world, but we take our stand in a world where it's getting more and more awkward and uncomfortable to take a stand. God still needs somebody to take that stand for righteousness. Hallelujah. Let's praise Him. Thank you, Lord, for your word today. Let it quicken our hearts. Let it do its intended work in our lives. We'll praise you for it and thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. These young men of Israel had been taken captive probably as children, small children, and taken to the land of Babylon from Israel. After the Babylonian armies had defeated the nation of Israel and went in and took spoils of everything they wanted in that land, then they got the brightest and the best of the children and said, we're going to take them back to Babylon and we're going to make Babylonians out of them. This was their full intent. And as the children grew up, they were there when their moms and dads didn't feel like singing by that river. How can we sing in a strange land, they said. I'm glad that through the power that comes from Jesus Christ, you can sing in a strange land. And I can sing in that land too. And as life has unfolded, we've all had some strange lands to sing in. God help us to never let circumstances take the songs out of our mouth. Amen? Even when you don't feel like singing, if you'll start, guess what? Usually in a few moments' time, you'll start feeling like singing it. Hallelujah. So just take that first step by faith. When trouble seems to be all around, when uh, you can't see past uh, 50 feet ahead of you, when, when, when it's darkness around, when, when trials and temptations are bombarding you, thank God, keep on singing your song about Jesus, because He will see you through, and He knows where you're at. And so, these young men were there, they witnessed all of that, and as they began to grow into, from children, childhood into young men, the Babylonians began to work with them and try to make Babylonians out of them. Uh, whenever they got into the king's program, they first of all changed their names. They were given Hebrew names, which most of the names of the Old Testament, when you search them out, they many of them will have a reference to Jehovah, uh, Almighty God, and that was the case of these young men. Hananiah, his name meant uh, that God has favored us. Michelle, it was that God is a strong God. Azariah, his name meant Jehovah has helped. Hallelujah. These, these, are, these are the things they heard as they grew up and mom or dad called their name. And that name to them Reference them to their God. Praise the Lord. And what a thrill it is when we can train our children up in the ways of the Lord. But their names were changed to Babylonian names. And instead of Hananiah, it became Shadrach, who was named for the Babylonian sun god. 
instead of uh, my shell, it became Meshach, which uh, was in honor of the planet Venus, which was worshipped. Instead of Azariah, he was given the name Abednego, the servant of the shining fire, which also the Babylonians, the Chaldeans worshipped the shining fire. And so, as they began to develop and they trained them in all the wisdom of Babylon, they trained them to be able to be servants to the king, to be young men who could, uh, yes, they were slaves in a way, but they were educated and highly trained people that would help the king with whatever work he wanted them to take. And so the process began to take away their heritage of uh, one God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Joshua and David and Elijah. They wanted them to forget about their God, their God, their childhood God. They wanted them to think of these new deities that they were being introduced to. And they did whatever they could, whatever they thought was necessary to retrain and, and get the thinking of these young men changed so that they could walk in a Babylonian culture and be accepted as part of that culture. And certainly we live in a similar world in, in the way that the, the spirits of the underworld are fighting against truth, fighting against the will of God being done in this earth and I'll get to that in a moment but the story goes on that as as we came to that point where they were going to have to fall down and worship this image that the king had seen he was the head of gold of the image it was the image that declares all the world powers guess what even down to our present hour the head was Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, but the feet were what we know today as the European market, the common market, the European Union, and the, the conglomeration of nations that make Europe up and have joined together to be one force in our world today. And that whole process... The king had just heard his dream interpreted. He was caught up with himself. Why not make an image with me being the very head of that image and all the people worshiping? So he called all of his governors, all of his wise men, all of his counselors in and commanded them that they fall down at the sound of the music and worship that 90 foot tall image. Nine foot wide image that started with gold and came with silver and then brass and, and iron and then iron and clay. You can read about it in Daniel chapter 2. And, but he was the head of it. He wanted to bring glory to himself. He thought that uh, he, he ruled the world, wor ruled his universe. And he declares such when he tells these young men, Who is that God that's going to save you out of my hand? Wrong thing to say, Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> Don't be challenging the Almighty God, sir. Whatever cuss, cussing you want to do is one thing. But when you start challenging Almighty God, you better find you a deep hole to hide in. And he'll get you there even. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar didn't have his eyes open yet. He thought he was the man with the plan. And so these three young men refused to bow. They refused to bend to his wishes or his commands. They refused to come under his authority in that regard. In all other regards, it did not violate their God or their faith. They would work with the king. But when it came down to worship, when it came down to commitment, heart commitment, they were not going to bow to anybody's wishes except Almighty God's. So you can change people's name, but 
You can't change their heart. Hallelujah. You might take the boy out of the country, but you can't take the country out of the boy. And they tried to change their name, tried to get them thinking about these deities that Babylonians worship, but it did not work. Hallelujah. Thank God for convictions we can put in our children. Thank God for truth we can plant in their hearts all the way through their childhood that will hold them steady in this world of iniquity that they are living in. And so, as the story is unfolded, they take their stand. That's how they compare with us today because we're living in a world that requires us to take a stand. If we dare to be silent and let false deities rule and reign in our day, false philosophies of mankind, if we just keep silent, that's what the world wants us to do. They want to shove us in a corner they don't want your Bible out on your desk. They don't want a lot of things. But there comes a time when uh, uh, we've got to take our stand. We can, we can go along to a certain extent. We can let them change our name if that's absolutely necessary. They can, they can do different things. But I'm telling you, when it comes down to serving the Lord Jesus Christ, let me stand! Take my stand for the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They want to brag on their philosophies. They want to shout about their concepts. They want to put forth all of their ideas and all of their false traditions of men. And they want me to shut my mouth and sit there. Well, there, there's a limit to shutting my mouth, folks got to be a limit to shutting your mouth too and that's why i'm preaching this today it's an hour we got to take our stand we don't have to be mean about it we can be gentle about it but we've also got to be firm about it and let folks know if you if you think you can talk your junk i'm gonna talk some of my truth hallelujah you want to press, produce all your philosophies and throw them out there and nobody raise their hand and bring a different point, then, uh, well, this is America, thank God. And I've got a right to proclaim the name of Jesus, too. <laughs> Hallelujah. But we're living in a world that wants us to just quiet down, just move away quietly, go to our corner and behave ourselves while they promote all kinds of wickedness, all kinds of sin, all kinds of perversion, and says this is the way it is. This is the way you need to accept it. All kinds of philosophies. And even in the religious world, the religious world has bought into the ecumenism, if I can get that word out right, ecumenical concepts of our world today. And it's okay if you believe in Jesus. Don't, don't call his name and accept everybody else's beliefs. Well, to a certain degree, we have to accept who they are. I mean, if they're a Muslim, they're a Muslim. We're going to try to get them to Jesus. <laughs> if they're a sinner, they're a sinner. We're going to try to get them to Jesus. We got, we got one answer. Hallelujah. We got one solution. You are complete in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. But they want us to accept them. All roads lead to heaven. All of those Shintoists and those Hinduists and all of those that worship, they, won't, they wouldn't think of having hamburger this afternoon for dinner because it's a cow and it might be their uncle. Or a faraway grandpa that's come back to live as a cow. Can you imagine a human being wanting to live like a cow so he can keep on living? And they're wanting me to buy that as truth or that it's okay for people to believe that, thinking that they're on their way or all going to find the same God at the end of the road is the concept. Some go this way, others go that way. 
But Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Now, either we're going to believe Jesus, and the strange thing is all these people that want us to accept all of their weird doctrines, they, they want to also say Jesus was a wonderful man, a great philosopher, a wonderful teacher of love and kindness. And yes, we should accept him as one of our prophets. But he didn't accept any of the other gods, any of the other deities. He said, I am the way. No man gets to God except by me. It's our world of picking and choosing what we want to believe, what we want to accept as truth. And everybody's fine. I'm okay. You're okay. Everybody's on their way searching for God. And when it all comes out in the end, every will, everyone will have found him. You might have to worship 30,000 other gods on your way uh, to go through this oriental religion. But uh, you'll find him at the end of the journey. And it'll all be the one true God that everyone's found through all the different ways. I'm just telling you, we're, we're living in a world where there are philosophies of men, ideas of men. And they try to break us down, try to break inroads into our mind and in our heart. And God help us to always be gentle and be kind when we're spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. But God help us to never back down on the truth of the gospel. It's still by the precious blood of Jesus. That my sins have been washed away. Somebody help me praise him today. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Our own battle is not with the different deities of Babylon, although some of them no doubt could go back that far. But we stand against the, the religion of secular humanism in our world today. It's a religion that sorts uh, of sorts without God, without the Bible. It has its own ideas. It chooses to exalt the intelligence of man and to actively resist the truth of scriptures. It believes in a secular humanism, believes in a, a, a universe without a creator. Man-made ethics without an authority. Life without judgment. It is one of the philosophies of the Antichrist and wars against Jesus Christ and what his apostles wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. It chooses to ignore and even despise references to God or to the Holy Scriptures. That, that spirit will try to make you uh, feel so ignorant in a world of uh, educated people they, they want you to feel like you are so backwoods, so, so ignorant of truth, and you uh, won't look at all their scientific evidence that they themselves, down the road, will prove wrong themselves. They've done it over and over and over again. Thank God, at least when they realize it was a hoax, that they'll tell it. That's nice. What they're believing now could be a hoax, too. Human, secular humanism teaches that the universe consists of matter and energy shaped into the present form by chance. Humans were created by the chance process of evolution. It rejects belief in a personal God and denies divine inspiration of the Bible. It asserts that knowledge does not exist apart from human discovery. It claims mankind improves only through human wisdom. It teaches that moral standards are not absolute but are relative according to the desires of the society. It rejects Bible standards. It encourages people to live with no belief in or dependence upon God. And the sad thing, some religions or even some Christian religions are even bowing at its altar. They, they, uh, they, they, they are people that do not believe. It would amaze us. I've done it in the past, found the different percentages of Christian ministers who do not believe Jesus was born of a virgin. They do not believe he's coming back again. 
It is shocking when you study the beliefs of those who are supposed to be proclaiming the truth of Jesus Christ to our world. This is why I felt impressed of the Spirit of God this week to remind you it's time for you to take your stand. In a world that's getting darker, God help us that have some light in our soul. To let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Hallelujah. 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 If we don't take our stand for God in the Bible, who will? Many in higher education have given themselves fully to this philosophy. Many. I know there are some subjects you go to, they're not concerned about creation. They're not concerned about spiritual things. They uh, just want you to dissect this frog maybe and check it out. Uh, and uh, many other uh, subjects that are available in our schools today. Uh, but many in scientific communities have also bowed to these same human philosophies. Thank God there's some that still hold the truth, even though highly educated. They still believe God's Word is divinely inspired. But we live in a world of hedonists and narcissists that believe in humanism. These principles. And they come through. You can't pick up the newspaper. Uh, you can't pick up a news magazine. You, can, you can, cannot pick up a scientific journal unless it's a Bible-based one without these principles of humanism being promoted, being driven in, being taught. And they, they, in, anything they produce, like a National Geographic uh, film or something they would show scientifically at IMAX, those type of nature films, they're always talking about things that uh, you have to be a humanist to, to accept. You have to be someone who doesn't believe the Bible to accept. And they just treat it as if, uh, if th this is established fact, when in fact it is not established. It's a theory of mankind. It's an idea and a philosophy of, of human beings trying to figure things out for themselves, leaving God out of the picture. They want God out of the picture. And it is a belief system. And the sad thing is they've made it so reasonable that many people who once believed in the beginning God now have all different kinds of other ideas that begin to chip away at the Word of God. Well, no, that's, that story's just there. That, that history's just there. That, that uh, other thing is just, it's, it's, the, 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 the Bible, you, you kind of got to pick and choose what you're going to believe. You know, it's a great book, but uh, no, 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 no. It's the book. Hallelujah. It's a book that will get us from earth to glory. It's a book that has salvation's plan in it. It's the book we ascribe to. We live our life according to. Why? We know there's one, one, one way, and way to God. His name is Jesus Christ. And in Him, in Him, we rejoice. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they had their work cut out for them. They realized and they went along as far as they could go along but there came a day when they couldn't go along anymore they had just gone too far they they had they got the commandment of the lord in their heart thou shalt love the lord thy god with all thy heart mind soul and strength hallelujah and thou shalt worship no other gods you'll have no other gods before thee Oh, thank God for the truth of the gospel. And this is where we have to prepare our children as they come up in this world and, and make sure we understand what they're learning. We can't just leave them and, and say, well, the school's going to do its work. You've got to know what school, the work school is doing. You've got to understand what the principles and precepts that the school is teaching. You, that means you've got to read the kids' textbooks, what you've got to do. 
what, what's in here. And when you see it, we don't want to raise a bunch of smart aleck kids that uh, fussing at their teacher over these things. But they, they do need to know how to take a stand. And when, when, when there's a questions, when there's, when there's a chance to make comments, that they would have the, enough strength in their little minds and spirits to say, I just want you to know I believe the Bible's right, and that's where my trust is. If that's all they can get out of their little mouths, hallelujah. There'll be a bunch of other kids right there too saying, yeah, 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 yeah. And it's not just come in our world. It's been here for decades, folks. It was strong in college when I was going to college. And I've told you about my English as literature teacher who kept uh, in every way. If you, if you did not believe the Bible was inspired, if you didn't have your own personal Pentecost experience, your own miraculous change in your life, that man, no doubt, changed the minds of thousands of young people with his constant ripping the scriptures, tearing them down, putting doubt, talking about the authors, tearing them down, quoting his authorities. This was in 70, 1970, folks. It was going on before that. Ripping at them, tearing them down. Laughing at them while he was puffing away on his Winston-Salem's. And I, I stood as much as I could stand, Brother Don. But something kept working on me. And finally, I got a chance to say something. So up my hand went. And I made my declaration. You know, I, I hear you, sir, talking about all these different authorities. I just want you to know that there are other authorities that would declare the truth of the Scriptures. Where you're trying to put doubt into our... I forget how I'd worded it. He didn't come after me wanting to fight me, but uh, I've made it pretty plain that day. To the point, he let me say something for two or three other times, and then it was over. My hand just hung out there by itself in the air. Said en enough of that talk going on. And he was the boss. So I just, I'd go ahead and wave at him every once in a while. <laughs> Let him know everybody wasn't agreeing with that secular humanism he was putting out there. But I had had the Holy Ghost for a number of years. I'd been taught in Sunday school like our kids are being taught right now. The God of the Bible, the truth of the Word, the power of the name of Jesus. I had seen lives already transformed. Oh, they couldn't get rid of their alcoholism. Couldn't get rid of their drugs. Went to all kinds of things to try to get rid of it. But one trip to the altar, hallelujah. God filling them with the Holy Ghost. I never shall forget the day when all the burdens of my heart rolled away. But there's this dampering on us even speaking our, our opinion. It's like, no, you know, don't rock the boat. Because they are so adamant in the belief of a, a universe without a God. Or without a God that cares. There's, there's many different branches of secular humanism. But they want, they just want, they just, there's that pressure down on Bible believing Christians to not speak up, to not take a stand. And God help us all to rightly discern situations. I think we always ought to speak with respect toward people in authority. Honor them for the position they hold. Be kind. But brother, there comes a time when we're not going to bow. Comes a time when you can put me in the fire, you can put me in the flood, you can do whatever you want to do, but I'm not saying that. I'm not, I, that's not who I am, not what I believe, not the God I serve. 
God, help us to understand when to exert our influence in a world that wants us all to shut up. Our institutions of higher education are in many cases, not all, thank God, but many, shrines built to the gods of philosophy, secular humanism, and the promotion of the spirits of Antichrist. That's why I want, I want to encourage you, if you've got children, grandchildren, going to secular colleges, do your very best to prepare them before they ever get there. Once they're in that, that rush of information flowing, it, it's, it's hard to, to make an impact then because uh, two or three times a week they're hearing that same philosophy over and over and over again. They need to have it in their heart. They need to have their own strong walk with God. They need to have the Word of God implanted. There are many helps in our, our religious world to help establish our children on uh, the truth of God's Word. And the fact that the Bible is the inspired Word of God. All of these things are there. But we've got to, as they're growing up, we've got to implant it in them and uh, brand them with it. You say, well, I don't, I don't, I don't want uh, to teach my children what to believe. Well, I guess you do, too. Some people pride themselves in being so, so wide open. They're not going to make them believe anything. They'll let them choose for themselves. Well, do you know some things? That's the question. We're not going to teach our children to wear their safety belt? Of course we are. We are uh, I know I'm preaching to the choir right here. But we've got to watch over them and protect them and keep them on their journey. And give them, give them reason. Give them serious reason uh, why the theories of secular humanism, the theories that are against Jesus Christ, that are in our world today and promoted as the truth... Why they are not the truth. They've never been proved. Never been observed. They're still theories. But the world doesn't want you to look at them as theory. This is the, their gospel truth. And you're, you're a fool to come against them. But the word tells us who the fool is. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. We don't go around calling them fools, but the Word called them a fool. God help us to, in this world that we live in, understand how vital it is for us to train our children and to work with them and to be aware of what they're being taught and give them reasonable arguments against those Lying theories that will cause people to wonder if the Word of God really is divinely inspired. Wonder if heaven, <laughs> is that just people's imagination or did Jesus know what he was talking about when he talked about it? God help us to train our children. Teaching them a few times is not training them. Training them is where you go over and over and make it interesting and go over and over and over again and again and again and again. They used to talk about soldiers cleaning their rifle in total darkness. They'd cleaned it so many times in the light they didn't need any light. They could clean that weapon Get ready for the next battle in total darkness. They take it all apart and put it all back together. Now that's what you call trained. God help us to put truth into our children. Do your best to not let them stay in a college atmosphere by themselves. In the dorms. College dorms have a bad name on them, folks. They're co-ed nowadays. I'm sure there's some that are not. But 
the vast majority of the secular colleges are co-ed. Guys and gals living in the same room together. And the expected thing of young people, even in high school, that's the sad part. This whole secular humanism reached on down into high school and middle school, and sometimes grade school, trying to change the moral code of a nation. It's not just the Democrats or the Republicans. It's not the independents. It's satanic. It's the devil's work. Not a political thing. It's the spirit of Antichrist that's at work in our world today. And which child can we sacrifice? That's why we've got to train them all. We don't want to give any of them to this world's philosophies. This isn't anything new. This has been happening ever since mankind was on this earth. And there were great men and women down through time that had to take their stand in their hour. And Caleb was one of them. Give me that mountain with the giants in it. That's the one I want. We don't find anyone else saying, no, Caleb, I want that mountain. No. They were glad to let Caleb take that mountain. That's where the giants were. That's where the giants, the God-cursing giants were. He wanted that mountain. And Caleb got that mountain and conquered it. Hallelujah. Esther, yes, I will go uninvited to the king. And if I perish, I perish. Putting her life on the line. And of course, Jesus, as he contemplated his own death at crucifixion, the Bible says he set his face as a flint, despising the shame. Hung naked in, in sight of the whole world that was around him there in Jerusalem. Talk about shame. Hung there. The hands of evil men. The Roman soldiers were just going through their daily activities. Someone else to torture a little bit. Whip them so bad that we almost kill them, but not quite. And finish them off on the cross. As Jesus contemplated, he set his face as a flint. I will endure. Despising the shame. But not, in, not turning away from it. So that innocent blood could be shed. That would cover my guilty soul. <laughs> and your guilty soul. I think we ought to praise him a little bit more here today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. As our musicians come. We've got to take our stand in this world for the Word of God, being the inspired Word of God. The message of Jesus Christ. The Gospel. We live in a world of many different Christian concepts even there's only one real source to define all of these Christian denominations and that is the Bible yes. got to go back to the Bible and let it do the defining all of us have come from many different areas one way or another back in my religious history on my dad's side they were all good Methodists. It was the shouting kind, the, the holiness Methodists of the 19th century, back in the 1800s. You read some of old John Wesley's preaching. He could, he could still preach that in an apostolic holiness loving church. And he preached it to those people and they lived it. 
Camp meetings would come and they'd shout their long, uncut hair down. I'm telling you, they had some church back there. And people would speak out, go to the history books. They would speak out strange things, didn't, hard, didn't know what they were doing. But it was recorded, strange words coming out of people's mouth in those Methodist camp meetings of the 1800s. On my other side was Baptists, primitive Baptists. The old King James Version Baptist, hallelujah. Shouting Baptist. And if you follow your religious roots, ain't no telling where they would lead. We've all come from afar. But oh, thank God we got to the church Jesus started. We got to Pentecost, hallelujah. We got to that, that apostolic message that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. I love the Methodist. I've been trying to reach them all my life. I love the Baptist. I love the Catholics. How about you? Do you love these people? They're searching, at least they're searching after Jesus Christ to some degree. Some of them are very committed. Some of them have died for their faith. I'm glad to let God judge all that. But oh, if we can just get people back in the book, that's where the Christian church was started. And that's where you can, without hesitation, lead people and go yourself to make sure of your eternal salvation. Is it in the book? That's our salvation that is in the book. That's our authority. And when the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached, God help us to declare it, declare it kindly, declare it sincerely, but declare it and not be shut down by the spirits of this world that are anti-Christ and against God working in this world. The fact that judgment is sure, that's another thing the secular humanists don't believe in. That there's going to be a judgment. There's going to be an accounting. And Jesus Christ is saying every word. Every word has to be dealt with. No sin's going to enter into heaven. It's all got to be dealt with. Thank God for an altar. Thank God for a place of repentance. We can deal with our sins today. Get them under the blood of Jesus Christ through repentance. Repentance. The Christian lifestyle, separation from this world of wickedness that's gone so far in immodesty and wickedness. Their entertainment is so very ungodly in so many areas. And it's been that way for a long time. I don't know when God's cup of wrath is going to get full, but one of these days... He's going to say, it's enough. He's going to call his people home. And a judgment like this world has never known will come on the face of this earth. What a sad day for those who haven't made the preparation. What a sad day for those who haven't bowed their knee to Jesus Christ. And made him Lord of their life through obedience to his word. What a sad day. Well, that should cause all of us to not go throughout a day without saying, Lord, help me find a hungry heart today. Help me find someone that I can talk to about you. Help me to win a neighbor, a friend. Help me to talk to them about the kingdom of God and eternal life. Help me to reach them, Lord Jesus. Let's all stand in his presence right now. And so the rest of the story, mighty fine. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, no, we're not going to bow. Oh, king, we're not careful to answer you in this matter. Which basically is saying, we, we made up our mind before you even made the command. This was made up in our mind a long time ago. We're going to serve the Lord 
and him only. And so when the king made a command to worship another god, it, they didn't even have to think about it. I'm sure they did being human. I'm sure they considered what they were about. The fact that they could lose their life here in the next day or so. But they stood with their convictions. Determined they're not going to fall down before this image of gold and worship it as if it was a living God. And so when the king's command came and, oh, he was kind, he was ready to give them another chance. They said, you can save your time. Don't have to waste any more time, king. Because we're not careful to answer you. Because we've already made up our mind we're serving the Lord. We've already made up our mind we're going to take our stand. And we're not going to bow. And King, we may not be delivered out of the fire. But it doesn't matter. We're going to be delivered out of your hands, O King. You may think you killed us. You may think that you destroyed this truth. But this truth is going to endure to all generations. Hallelujah. It's going on. If I'm taken out because I believe it, so be it. God's accepted other sacrifices of martyrdom all down through time. And I'll be the next one. But God's able to deliver me if he chooses to. Hallelujah. And so the king commanded his strongest men to throw them and bind them and throw them in the fire. And they bound these three young men. And on their way to the fire, no doubt the, the air was so hot, the men just tried not to even take one breath. I don't know how they were slain, if it was a miraculous slain or the fire just whipped out and took their breath out of them and destroyed them on the spot. But they threw them into the fire. And I mean, in just a few moments time, the king's talking to people and say, didn't we throw three in? Didn't we just throw three in? I see four walking in the fire. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, and I like his last exclamation and the fourth one looked like the son of God oh hallelujah hallelujah and Jesus will be with you through whatever fire your testimony will take you through too yes he will hallelujah and the Lord was with them and so the king called them out and they couldn't even smell smoke on them they, they, they didn't have all that was burned off them was the ropes that were tying them down. But their clothes weren't singed. Their hair wasn't singed. Everything was just fine. And the king realized what he had come up against. And he said, anybody that talks against the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, anybody that criticizes him, it gets thrown into the fire. <laughs> Boy, he, them politicians, they know how to flip it quick, don't they? <laughs> as soon as they catch the wind of what people want to hear, bloop. not all of them. <laughs> Some of them are statesmen. I'm talking about politicians. But this this one, he flipped it. He better. He knew he was up against something he, he couldn't handle. And then he promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He wanted the favor of this God. <laughs> Whoever he is and wherever he's at, he wanted his favor. Those idolaters, they had different concepts about God and gods, you know. But we're living in a world that'll try to strip us from our convictions. Take away our stands for the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you want to take your stand in this world, why don't you move forward if you can. If you're able to move close into this altar. Let's, let's pray one for another. Let's affirm one another in the spirit of God and the word of God.
Every one of us will be tested from time to time about our convictions, about who we are. But we can take our stand in this present world, a world of darkness, a world of sin and iniquity. But yes, where darkness is, grace Where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. The light of God's Word will come into our hearts. Hallelujah. Let's call on His name together right now. Thank you.